In this lecture, I'll talk about the concept of regularization. First, I'll talk briefly about the strength of empirical evidence and how it depends on the sample size n. Then I'll talk about areas of biological research that involve particularly large number of explanatory variables. And then I'll introduce the problem. What if you have a small sample size, but a large number of explanatory variables? And the even bigger problem, when your sample size is smaller than the number of parameters. And finally, I'll talk about the solution, which is to use regularization. For the purpose of this lecture, please keep in mind that whenever I say n, I'm talking about the number of independent observations, or the sample size. And whenever I say p, I mean the number of parameters in your model. Also note that in literature, regularization is used interchangeably with penalization and shrinkage, but all of these three words have exactly the same meaning in statistics. So far, we've mostly been talking about models that can produce p-values, and in almost every summary of the models that we've seen so far, p-values are automatically included. So that might give you the wrong impression that a p-value is somehow a very important part of statistical analysis. But actually, a p-value is a very weak form of evidence. If we plot the uh, strength of evidence in this imaginary scale uh, from zero to infinite, then on one ex extreme we have the um, uh, assumptions that we make or our prior beliefs, and on the other extreme we would have actual proof. Now, evidence never constitutes proof, so uh, whatever we do in biology and statistical analysis is somewhere in the middle. But we can explain the relative strength of evidence. So the weakest form of evidence would just be observing something once, and slightly stronger evidence would be observing something several times, so you'll see a trend. A p-value that's significant is really just only after that, and it's similar to having a model that has a decent fit within the sample. It isn't very strong evidence. Much better evidence is if you cross-validate your model and you still get a good fit, uh, because this is a form of internal validation. You get an estimate of the out-of-sample performance by looking at how your sample would perform by leaving several observations out and then testing on the remaining observations. This is still internal validation because you only have access to one study and one sample, so much, much stronger evidence would be if you have multiple studies. For example, a replication study performed by a different lab, or some other form of external validation by including multiple data sets. Then the strongest form of empirical evidence if, is if you have multiple external validations, or independent research groups all trying to validate the results that you have found. And um, yeah, for example, think of vaccines developed by um, um, yeah, different companies that are trying to uh, combat the coronavirus. Then yeah, just looking at a p-value isn't very convincing evidence. We want people to be able to validate their results in multiple hospitals across multiple countries. Um, so we want um, more convincing evidence than just the, the difference is non-zero, p is less than blah, blah, blah. So with that in mind, the only reason that p-values are so common in biology is that usually the sample size of uh, fundamental studies and also uh, pilot studies and uh, something for your internship uh, concerns very small sample sizes. And when the sample size is very small, you are limited to simple analyses. And usually uh, there isn't much more that you can conclude than some p-value and an effect size. But if you have a large enough sample size, there are much more convincing measures of evidence than just p-values. And today we're going to be talking about one of those, namely regularized models. So the actual required sample size depends on the complexity of the study design. So we've been talking about this before, but I just want to repeat it uh, to make sure it's all clear. So, uh, for example, is there a large natural variance among experimental units? Uh, so you can think of uh, bacterial cultures from the same strain, raised under the same conditions, um, then you would expect there to be small variants. And the same with uh, uh, laboratory mice that have been inbred for many generations to be genetically similar, and they have been raised under uh, almost identical laboratory uh, environments. So you would expect the variance between different mice to be small. But uh, if you have a clinical trial and you include humans of a variety of genetic and environmental backgrounds, then you can expect the variance between individuals to be very large. And this adds to the required sample size. Uh, 
In addition, uh, depending on the technique that you're using, there might be a larger measurement error. So some techniques like nanodrop are very precise and other techniques like Western blots are very rough and introduce a lot of error, which increases the required sample size. So with that in mind, please don't pay too much attention to the um, numbers shown here, but this is just a rough indication of what kind of models you can use when you have a particular order of magnitude of samples. So on the very low end, we have a significance test, which is suitable for the smallest of sample sizes. Uh, but actually, when the sample size is really large, almost everything will be significant, even if the effect size is very small. So a significance test isn't very interesting for large data sets. Uh, and also, it's a very weak form of evidence because all you're testing with a null hypothesis of no difference is that the difference isn't zero but a difference of 0 0.0001 might still be biologically irrelevant. So significance isn't much uh, of convincing evidence compared to, let's say, the effect size. Um, in regularized linear models, we do something very different. What we're trying to do is identify the uh, effects on the outcome by shrinking coefficients of lesser influence. And then what remains is the largest coefficient. The benefit of this uh, shrinkage decreases at larger sample sizes. So especially at very large sample sizes, you might not need regularization. And you can just use any kind of predictive model and uh, validate it by some form of cross-validation. Um, but yeah, for this, you need very large sample sizes. I'd say it's technically possible from uh, somewhere in the tens of samples, uh, but it doesn't become very practical until you're in the hundreds or perhaps even thousands. So today we're talking about this man in the middle, which is a regularized linear model chosen by cross-validation. In the lecture on model selection, we talked about the problems of omitted variable bias and confounding. Many studies use approaches that try to circumvent this by measuring everything that might have an effect on the outcome, and that way there can't be omitted variable bias. And a very a good example of this is the omics field that tried to measure all of one particular aspect of life at once. So genomics tries to look at all genes at once, and proteomics tries to look at all proteins at once, and metabolomics at all metabolites. And um, because they don't come with a pre-specified set of um, uh, variables to include, these types of studies are often called hypothesis-free. And yeah, some example research questions would be uh, the single nucleotide polymorphisms associated with cancer, or you're looking at um, metabolites from plant extracts and just any of them, uh, or you're looking uh, generally at brain activity from functional MRI or interaction be between plants and bacteria. So uh, these do not come with pre-specified uh, hypotheses. They might, might come with a research question, like uh, what is causing the differences between people with Alzheimer's and without Alzheimer's, and how can we see it in terms of brain activity? But we don't measure a specific variable, we just look at a very large set of variables and then select whatever seems relevant. Now, uh, the problem is that when you have a small sample size compared to the number of explanatory variables, that um, even though omitted variable bias is uh, unlikely, uh, there will be many, many explanatory variables. And uh, your sample size isn't currently bigger or something, and it's still difficult to obtain a large number of observations. So it's almost certain that you will overfit if your sample size is similar to the number of parameters, or in the same order of magnitude even. And ordinary least squares, iteratively reweighted least squares, which is what you use for a generalized linear model, and uh, restricted maximum likelihoods, which is what you use for a mixed model, these methods don't work if the sample size is smaller than the number of parameters. So how do you choose which variables to include? We already talked about this for a little bit in a model selection lecture, but there we generally assumed that you have a larger sample size than the number of parameters. But what if you don't? Then where do you even begin? So you might be tempted to just try many different models with many different subsets of the explanatory variables. Uh, but this is actually a really bad idea. It's called stepwise regression. And if you do this, there will be too many candidate models uh, for whatever measure you want to use to uh, select the model. And you'll almost certainly find a model that performs well in the sample, but not in the population. So um, yeah, if you 
if you want to read a little bit more about this, uh, you should search for a question on uh, uh, cross validate. It's called algorithms for automatic model selection. So I'll show it real briefly. So you recognize it is this question and it's some someone with exactly this problem. Like I have a very large number of explanatory variables. Uh, how am I going to choose which I want to do it automatically. And basically everyone here agrees that it's a very bad idea. Uh, but it can be very helpful to understand why it's a bad idea. So if you don't quite understand yet why uh, having a large number of candidate models is uh, a problem, then please have a look at this question. So that means that in every research, we have to make a choice between either measuring a few specific variables, which we think are the most important uh, for the response variable, uh, with the chance of having omitted variable bias, confounding, and you know, you have to make a selection, which also introduces its own kind of bias, um, or measuring a very large number of variables, which is almost guaranteed to overfit. So how do you find the right number of variables and which ones? So um, yeah, in addition, especially when we talk about things like the omics fields, then um, the number of variables can easily exceed the number of independent observations, which is a big problem. Um, because whenever this is the case, there are a lot of uh, phenomena that occur that render ordinary techniques useless or invalid. And uh, yeah, this problem, this choice of having few variables, but uh, omitted variable bias or many variables uh, and having uh, yeah, a large number of complex problems uh, is called the curse of dimensionality. So let me illustrate one particular problem or two particular problems. First, we have a combinatorial explosion, which I think is very easy to understand. Uh, if you have uh, two variables, then you have variable one, variable two, and there can be one interaction between the two. But if you have three variables, then you have variable A, B, and C, and you, have, uh, you can have the combination A, B, you can have the combination A, C, and the combination B, C. So then we're already talking uh, three variables and three possible interactions. For four variables, you can already have uh, A times B, A times C, A times D, and then B times C, etc. So the point being that um, the number of uh, explanatory variables, when it increases, the number of combinations between them will increase exponentially. And uh, this means that it becomes increasingly difficult to screen for relevant interactions. Uh, another big problem is the coverage of your sampling. So let's say that uh, we have a discrete uh, sample space. So there are only 10 possible uh, outcomes for a particular variable, like let's, let's say a 10 sided uh, die, and uh, you randomly pick five different uh, positions. Then in one dimension, you have already uh, got a 50% coverage because you picked five out of 10 possible positions. But if you have two dimensions and you have to pick a position in uh, the X direction and the Y direction, then just using a, uh, a single observation five times will only give you 5% coverage because there are now 10 times 10 is 100 positions and you only occupy five of them. In three dimensions, uh, we decrease by another uh, step exponentially to only a half a percent. And you know maybe one observation is over here uh, and the other ones are somewhere in this cube. And in four dimensions, it becomes more sparse and more sparse. So your coverage reduces very, very quickly. Uh, that means that uh, if you keep your sample size constant, uh, your total coverage of a high dimensional space becomes increasingly sparse. So how do you deal with it? Uh, we already talked about one particular uh, way to deal with high dimensional data, which is PCA or principal component analysis. And uh, yeah, this is a very ex uh, useful exploratory data tool. Uh, and it can also be generalized to uh, what's called MDS, multidimensional scaling, but that's not part of the course. And uh, a very uh, recent technique that is also gaining a lot of traction uh, is called TSNE, uh, T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. And all of these methods are um, yeah, very useful for quickly summarizing high dimensional data. But you know, sometimes you want to do more than summarizing. And that's where the techniques of this uh, lecture come in. So a uh, lasso, rich, and elastic net uh, are all regularization techniques. And the nice thing is that we can apply these to many of uh, the statistical methods that we've been using so far, including linear regression. So it allows us to answer uh, much more interesting questions than just a simple summary made by PCA.
In addition, uh, you might think, well, I can just do a PCA and then perform regression with my principal components. And of course you can do that, but you'll have to inspect all the loadings of all the principal components that you use, and then somehow try to understand how they relate to the actual outcome. So the exact contribution of individual variables is quite difficult to express from something like PCA, which is why you know, we usually refer to PCA as an exploratory technique. And in, in case like this, regularization can provide a much more useful alternative. Um, all right, so before I continue to explain what regularization actually is, I want to uh, be very clear on what you have to know because regularization is a difficult topic. Uh, so the only things that you have to know for the context of this course is uh, what regularization is, why you would use this, um, why you would use regularization, and um, why you would pick uh, one over the other of the three methods that I'll explain, so lasso, rich, and elastic net. And finally, how you choose the amount of regularization, which is uh, usually called lambda. Uh, if you do want to use regularized regression, uh, there's a very nice implementation in the package GLMnet that allows you to use uh, simple linear models and generalized linear models with any of lasso, rich, or elastic net. Uh, and it also includes uh, its own cross validation scheme. Um, so the assignment shows an example of uh, how to use this package. But uh, yeah, what you have to know uh, for the exam, for example, is just uh, what it is, how you use it, how you would pick one over the other, and how you choose the amount of regularization. All right, so with that out of the way, um, let's get to the actual techniques, uh, starting with lasso. So most of what I'm going to explain here is also covered in uh, Advanced Biostatistics, Chapter 4, which I've uploaded on Brightspace. Um, yeah, this chapter isn't finished, but what you have to know for the purpose of the exam is already in there. Um, so yeah, if you want to have a printed version of this, uh, you can look at uh, the PDF. All right, so LASSO uh, is an abbreviation, stands for Least Absolute Shrinkage and Selection Operator. And it works by shrinking variable estimates by penalizing the objective with the sum of absolute values of the coefficients. Um, and yeah, when this happens, uh, some variable estimates are shrunk to zero. And uh, then you can say that whatever estimates remain that aren't zero have been selected. So it's a form of variable selection. So uh, let's see how that works. In regression, we have the ordinary least squares objective, uh, which you can find in the book in uh, 2.5. And uh, it looks like this. And you know, you might not be familiar with this operator, uh, arg minimize, but all it means is uh, choose beta. Oh, sorry, I've written it below. It just means uh, choose the values of beta such that the sum of squared differences from the observation is as low as possible. And uh, yeah, here, when you have yi, that's an actual observation, and y hat, that's the predicted uh, ob uh, observation by your model. So you have to choose the betas in this equation such that uh, the estimated value uh, differs as little as possible from the actual value. And we do that by minimizing the squared differences. So that's what this means. Now, uh, when you have less observations than the parameters, uh, you can't estimate this equation anymore. So uh, lasso adds a penalty for the sum of absolute coefficients. And that looks like this. So it's just the original uh, least squares uh, objective, but we add a penalty, lambda times the sum of absolute coefficients. Um, and that makes sure that no matter how many coefficients we add, uh, we can always estimate this goal. So by adding a penalty for the sum of coefficients, uh, Lasso ensures that every added explanatory variable increases the overall error. And that means that we can still minimize the error. So the sum of all contributions uh, can never exceed the restriction that we impose by Lasso. And uh, what that means uh, practically is that it prevents overfitting, uh, provided that we choose the right lambda. Now, you might be wondering at this point, uh, how am I supposed to choose this lambda? And um, how am I supposed to calculate this? Uh, you can calculate this uh, programmatically and lambda we're going to choose by uh, cross validation. So you don't have to do that by hand. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, yeah, a lambda controls the amount of regularization, which means that if you have very small values of lambda, uh, there will be uh, many non-zero estimates. And if you have very large values of lambda, uh, you will have uh, a lot of variables that have been shrunk completely to zero. So what does that look like? 
Here we have a uh, trace plot of uh, all the different uh, values that we could choose for lambda. So on the log scale, because uh, uh, the penalty has to become exponentially larger for differences in effect. Um, and here we see each of 500 different uh, coefficients. So we have 500 explanatory variables. And as we increase the uh, penalty, we see how the coefficients change. And you can also see that at certain points, some of them dip right into uh, zero, meaning that they have been uh, selected out. And you can also see this in the top uh, axis over here. This is the number of remaining variables that are non-zero. Now, of course, if we choose a really, really um, large penalty, then uh, no uh, variables at all will be selected. And if we're very lenient, then uh, many variables will be selected. So uh, yeah, but the question is then, how can we choose lambda such that we have an appropriate number of variables? And the answer is by cross-validation. So I've already talked about this briefly uh, during the uh, model selection uh, lecture. And um, I think you already had a lecture on cross-validation as well. In case you haven't, uh, cross-validation uh, works, uh, put briefly, just by training the model on uh, one part of your observations and then testing the model on the remaining part of your observations. And then you repeat this process by leaving out a different part of your observation. And you do this a different number of times, uh, and then you uh, average or you sum the results, and you see uh, which value of lambda results in the lowest cross-validated error. Now, um, if we use the function cross-validate glmnet, uh, it performs cross-validation automatically to select lambda, uh, and you'll see this in the assignment. So why would you use lasso? Uh, first of all, of course, we can estimate the parameters, even if we don't have enough observations, which is very useful. Uh, and yeah, Lasso uh, not only fixes the problem of n smaller than p, uh, but it also functions as a variable selection tool. And in addition, Lasso is fairly robust to outliers, uh, because the absolute value of an estimate only has a small contribution to the objective. So let me go back real quick to show what I mean. Um, if we look at this penalty, we have the least squares objective and we have the penalty by lasso. Uh, if you have an outlier, then uh, okay, that would increase your uh, sum of squares by quite a lot, which is why ordinarily squares is sensitive to outliers. Um, but yeah, we also have this uh, other penalty added for the coefficients and a coefficient that increases and uh, the absolute value doesn't change as rapidly as the squared value. So that means that it is fairly robust to outliers because uh, absolute values grow less quickly than squared values. All right, so disadvantage of lasso. First of all, lasso is just popular because it selects variables, but from a, a statistical point of view, there is no real justification for this method. There's nothing magical about the absolute values that uh, makes it seem like a good choice. Um, it just is one of the first thing that was come up with and yeah, because it happens to shrink things to zero uh, It can be very useful to choose which variables you want to include But uh, yeah, that leads us to another disadvantage um, uh, Sorry the, the last one different samples may yield different selected variables. So uh, yeah in the assignments for example, you can try and uh, remove some observations and then you'll see that uh, Lasso can come up with a completely different solution so it isn't always stable, depending on the type of data. And that brings us to the uh, remaining disadvantage, which is that Lasso does not work well if your explanatory variables have high correlation between each other. And uh, especially when this correlation is uh, near perfect, then uh, Lasso will tend to select one of the two variables essentially at random, and not because one of them is more important than the other. So it's popular because it selects variables, but the disadvantage is that, yeah, this variable selection, how well it works, kind of depends on your data. And that brings us to the second technique, which is called ridge. And in the case of uh, regression analysis, we call it ridge regression. So uh, just like lasso, ridge works by shrinking the variable estimates with a penalty. And uh, we add this penalty to the usual ordinary least squares objective. Uh, when this happens, the estimates are slowly shrunk towards zero uh, as we increase uh, the amount of regularization. But contrary to Lasso, Rich never shrunks the variables exactly to zero. Uh, 
Uh, so yeah, the obvious disadvantage is that nothing becomes zero, so we don't have variable selection. But the advantage is that correlations between explanatory variables remain preserved because everything is shrunk proportionally. So uh, let's have a look at the notation of rich regression. Here again, we have the ordinary least squares objective. And um, yeah, this is then the predicted values. Um, and rich adds a penalty to solve the n less than p problem for the sum of squared coefficients. So we already have the sum of squared difference from the observations, but Rich says, uh, yeah, wait a moment. Uh, you also have to uh, minimize the number of, uh, uh, sorry, the sum of your uh, estimates. And uh, yeah, Lasso did this with the squared values of the estimates and Rich does it with the, uh, sorry, Lasso does it with the absolute values of the estimates and Rich does it with the squared values of the estimates. Now, um, Imposing a squared penalty, that kind of looks familiar, right? Because here we also have a penalty for the squared differences. And uh, as you'll remember from uh, 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 linear regression, we assume that the errors follow a normal distribution. Actually, it's the same for rich regression. It's like assuming that your estimates come from a normal distribution. And this is actually something nice because it's uh, defensible from a mathematical point of view. For example, let's say that you're doing some genomic study and you have, um, I don't know, 500 genes that you measured, then it's reasonable to assume that most genes have little to no contribution to whatever you're measuring. And some genes have a positive uh, effect, some genes have a negative effect, and only few of them have a really large effect or a really small effect. So because of this, rich regression is very popular uh, among statisticians because it has a, a nice interpretation. Um, and yeah, let's look at the... Uh, other thing why it's uh, very popular, and that's because it shrinks, shrinks the uh, estimates proportionately. So by adding a penalty for the sum of coefficients, squared in this case, uh, Rich also ensures that the um, added variables all increase the overall error. So um, Rich Regress says uh, you can add whatever you want, but the sum of all contributions to the outcome cannot be too large. And uh, this also prevents overfitting, just like Lasso provided that we choose the right lambda. And also just like uh, uh, lasso, uh, lambda again means the amount of regularization. So small values uh, leave uh, many non-zero estimates and large values still leave many non-zero estimates, but they are uh, slowly shrunk towards zero. All right, so what does that look like? You can see that it looks very different than the lasso solution. The most obvious difference is the number of lines, right? Um, so if we look at the top, we can see what's going on. And that's that uh, at every value of lambda, we still have 500 variables because it shrinks towards zero, but it never exactly reaches zero for any estimate until, you know, the parameter space is too small and then everything is zero. So uh, yeah, again, in this plot, each line is a coefficient of an explanatory variable. And Rich says, uh, okay, you know, those variables can have uh, whatever... Uh, uh, value you want, um, but I'm going to uh, make them proportionately smaller depending on how large the sum of all effects can be on the outcome. So as lambda increases, the estimates are shrunk proportionately, uh, but at each value of lambda, there are still 500 variables. It just changes how large those variables can be. Uh, yeah, just like Lasso, we choose this value, value of lambda by cross validation. So whether we want to be over here or over here, or somewhere in the middle, uh, you do that by cross-validation. And uh, again, in the assignment, uh, you don't have to implement cross-validation because uh, that's already part of the package that we're using. So why then would you use rich regression over lasso? Um, okay, first, just like lasso, we have solved the problem of n less than p, or n similar to p, uh, because uh, we can prevent overfitting now. And uh, the nice thing about rich regression is that it preserves the original correlations between the explanatory variables. So um, yeah, even if you have a highly correlated variables, then no matter how much you shrink, the uh, relative uh, coefficients will, would be the same as if you had unrestricted uh, uh, coefficient estimates. And uh, yeah, in some cases, uh, rich regression actually makes sense and is something that uh, uh, if you're going to justify your model, um, it's easy to write uh, a reason for. Uh, namely, it is like assuming that the parameter estimates come from a normal distribution. 
The disadvantage is, uh, oh, sorry, it says less. It should say rich over here. Disadvantage of rich is that rich doesn't select variables. Um, and uh, rich is also quite sensitive to outliers because, uh, yeah, if we uh, look at the objective here, we not only have the squared differences from the predicted values, but we also add the squared coefficient estimates. Now you can imagine what an outlier does. It increases the uh, sum of squares by a large amount because the squared difference of an outlier will be really big. Uh, and it also uh, changes the coefficients quite large if there's an influential observation. So that means that, uh, yeah, if there are uh, big outliers in your um, data, then uh, rich might not always work as well. And that brings us to the last one, which is called elastic net. Now, elastic net is just a combination of the previous two I explained. So we have the lasso and we have the rich penalty and elastic nets just says, well, why not both? Uh, so it shrinks the variable estimates by uh, penalizing it with a mixture of the absolute estimates and the squared estimates. And um, yeah, it uh, shrinks the estimates somewhat proportionately uh, and, you know, they can also become exactly zero. So just like, uh, yeah, the combination uh, uh, suggests, it has some of the properties of lasso and some of the properties of the rich. So, uh, yeah, correlation between explanatory variables are not preserved. It doesn't have this nice rich uh, property, uh, but elastic net performs okay, even if explanatory variables are highly correlated, whereas lasso will simply fail or do something uh, completely unstable where if you remove one observation, all your results may be different. So uh, let's look again at the objective. Uh, this is just the same as the previous slides, just so you can have a look if you want to pause this. Um, but yeah, the difference with elastic net is that it adds both penalties. So here we have the sum of absolute coefficients and we have the sum of squared coefficients. And then uh, elastic net says you have to choose a mixture of the two. So this was alpha. Uh, over here does if uh, alpha is uh, one then uh, we add only absolute values and then the elastic net is the lasso objective and if alpha is zero then this term becomes zero and one minus zero this term becomes uh, half which is for uh, technical reasons but uh, yeah just ignore the half um, and in that case it would be pure rich uh, uh, penalty and anything in between zero and one will give you a mixture of rich and lasso, which is what we call the elastic net. All right, so uh, how does it work? Just like lasso and rich, elastic net ensures that every added explanatory variable increases the error. And that's what we want, right? We, because uh, we want a model that um, uh, doesn't just fit the sample well, but also works on the population. So adding more and more and more effects is fine as long as the sum of their contributions doesn't become too big. Um, so again, provided we choose a, uh, the right value for lambda, then elastic net can completely prevent overfitting. Um, yeah, just like uh, the others we talked about, lambda uh, just means the amount of regularization, where uh, small values uh, of lambda leave many non-zero estimates, and large values of lambda can shrink variables towards zero. And if you have uh, a non-zero amount of uh, lasso included there so alpha in between zero and one um, then it will also uh, shrink variables exactly to zero now and then this alpha value controls the relative amount of lasso and rich shrinkage which you could also optimize uh, also by cross-validation so what does the elastic net look like um, yeah it's a bit uh, easier to see if we just plot them all next to each other first we had the lasso uh, solution which uh, yeah, is uh, good for variable selection, but uh, yeah, it uh, can have very strange paths. Uh, th this one looks all right, uh, but you can see that it doesn't shrink coefficients proportionately. The rich regression, on the other hand, as we decrease the parameter space, then all the coefficients are shrunk in the same manner. So um, it preserves the original uh, correlations between the explanatory variables. Now, elastic net is just somewhere in between the two. And uh, if you choose an alpha value uh, close to uh, zero, it will look more like rich. And if you choose an alpha value close to one, it will look more like lasso. All right, so just like uh, uh, the other ones, we can choose the amount of uh, regularization by, um, uh, by cross-validation. 
But the difference is that, yeah, if you want to cross validate Lambda, you have to set alpha to some fixed amount. So first you have to choose one and then you can cross validate the other. It is possible to simultaneously optimize them, but uh, that's not something that we have discussed in this course and it's uh, a little bit more complicated. Uh, if it interests you, uh, you should look up the package carrot, which can do uh, cross validation of multiple um, unknowns at the same time. But you don't have to know this for your course. All right, so finally then, let's look at all three, why you would use them and why you wouldn't use them. Uh, so why would you use regularization at all and why would you pick one over the other? So first off, all of these methods fix the n smaller than p value. And also when n is close to p, uh, it uh, prevents overfitting. So it solves the problem of high dimensionality in regression. Uh, but which one uh, is best depends on what you want to do. So let's have a bit of a look at uh, why that matters. Lasso works with the absolute uh, values of the uh, coefficients, which is also called the L1 norm. And rich works with the squared values of the penalty. Uh, sorry, squared values of the coefficient. Now, that means that uh, Lasso can select variables and rich cannot. And elastic net is a combination of the two. So as long as there's a non-zero amount of this, we can select variables. Uh, Lasso and elastic net don't really have a mathematical justification. So the only reason you would use them is from a practical perspective that you want to uh, uh, select variables and they can do this. Um, but actually the rich solution is the most probable uh, solution under a number of assumptions on the coefficients, namely that they are normally distributed with a mean of zero, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, but uh, Lasso tends to uh, randomly select one variable among a set of correlated variables. So it works very poorly uh, when variables are strongly correlated, whereas Rich preserves correlation and has no problem with this at all. Uh, ElasticNet can deal with correlated variables, but it doesn't preserve correlation. So if you need variable selection and your variables are strongly correlated, you probably want to use ElasticNet. Uh, if you don't care about variable selection, you probably just want to use Rich. And if there isn't strong correlation between explanatory variables, then you can just go with lasso if you want to select variables. All right, so um, yeah, parameter estimates of the lasso can vary substantially from rich. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't use lasso if you don't need variable selection because rich has a justification and lasso does not. Uh, Elastic net, uh, yeah, has two different penalties. So sometimes that can result in uh, underestimation of parameters because uh, the penalty becomes too large. And there are ways to correct for this, but we're not gonna discuss that now. So that's a quick overview of the differences and uh, yeah, the meaning for what you're trying to do, variable selection or dealing with correlated variables, et cetera. Um, so let's continue to some uh, summarizing slides. Uh, first, Regularization is fundamentally different than unpenalized regression. So that's what we've been doing so far with a linear model, generalized linear model, and a mixed model. And uh, if you have a very large number of explanatory variables and you don't absolutely need p-values, then regularization is a better approach. And you know you cannot report a p-value for a regularized model, but especially if you uh, perform a lasso or elastic net, you can report which variables were selected. So yeah, if you want to know which variables contribute to the outcome, uh, in a normal linear model, you could do this with a p-value, but yeah, if you use less or elastic net, you can just report the non-zero ones. Uh, if you want to know how each of a large set of variables affect the outcome, uh, and you're interested in the actual values, then rich is probably the most correct solution. And finally, if you want to do prediction, uh, yeah, I've, I've said this several times before, but prediction is a bit different than what we've been doing so far. I would just try them all um, and see which one works best. Although uh, in my experience, that's usually rich or elastic net. All right, so the only thing that keeps people from using regularization and the reason that uh, yeah, most of the articles you'll see are about p-values uh, and not about regularized models is because people are very used to using p-values and reporting confidence intervals and whatnot. And uh, yeah. Uh, regularization is a form of bias. And when you add bias, there is no real way uh, or no agreed upon way of estimating the standard error. And in turn, this makes it very difficult to obtain a correct p-value or a confidence interval. Uh, 
Um, yeah, there is no, uh, in short, there is no consensus on how to calculate p-values and confidence intervals for regularized models. Now, there is a package called uh, selective inference that can calculate p-values for particular lasso models uh, under additional assumptions. Um, but yeah, I, I don't recommend that you use this unless you know what you're doing. So uh, yeah, if this really interests you, you can read up on it and you can see what those additional assumptions are. And then you can decide for yourself, uh, do these make sense in the context of my internship or my research? And if the answer is yes, then you can use it. All right, finally, uh, I want to give a little bit more uh, in-depth explanation about some things, but you don't have to know these to pass the course. Uh, so yeah, just to be very clear, uh, every, everything that says bonus slides is just extra explanation, but it's not part of the course. So uh, I just mentioned bias, right? Um, and the ordinary least squares objective that we use in uh, linear models is unbiased. So that means that anything we add to the objective uh, adds bias. Uh, so yeah, regularized regression adds a penalty and that adds something, so it is biased. So bias sounds bad, so it, it raises the question, why would you use regularization? Why would you use a biased estimator if we already have this unbiased estimator? Now, we already saw one reason, namely n smaller than p, and then you don't have a choice. You have to use regularization. But actually, there are other reasons to use um, regularization. And that is because a biased estimator can perform better than an unbiased estimator. And that's something that I explain in this figure from uh, uh, the book Advanced Statistics. Um, namely, if you have an unbiased uh, estimator that has high variance, so that means uh, it's sensitive to the sample. Uh, so if you remove an observation or you repeat the experiment, uh, you can get a very different result. Um, then adding bias by means of regularization, uh, it means that on average, this one is not correct, right? This one is on average at a distance of zero from the population parameter. So that means that if you would uh, draw an infinite number of samples from the population and uh, infinitely many times do the same analysis, then ordinary least squares is on average perfectly correct and regularized uh, regression is on average wrong. But these averages don't really matter, right? Because you only have one sample usually. And when you only have one sample of uh, some sample size, then uh, you'd rather be close to the population parameter than on average correct, right? Because if we look at the area uh, under the curve, then you can see that on average, um, the, uh, uh, the unpenalized regression is zero. But uh, if we only have a single sample, then uh, yeah, there is a 68% chance that it will be within minus one or one uh, standard deviation from the uh, actual population parameter. Now this biased one, uh, the chance that it's between minus one and one is actually higher. And how is that possible? Very simple, by adding some bias, we remove so much variance that the total sum of uh, difference from the actual population has decreased. So it's a bit of a technical explanation, but uh, yeah, hopefully it can help you uh, understand why uh, bias isn't always bad. And, and the simple answer is because your estimator has bias and variance, and by adding bias, sometimes you can remove so much variance that you still have a better chance of getting good estimates. The second thing I want to explain is why Lasso is able to select variables while Rich cannot. The easiest way to understand this is by considering two variables, x1 and x2. And um, yeah, let's say that we chose a value of lambda such that the sum of their absolute values cannot be bigger than 1. Right, so the lasso penalty says the absolute values cannot be bigger than some uh, pre-specified uh, amount. And what that means is if uh, x1 has a coefficient beta1 and x2 has a coefficient beta2, then uh, if beta1 is equal to 1, then yeah, the sum is already equal to 1, so beta2 has to be equal to 0. Uh, and the other way around, if beta2 is equal to 1, then uh, yeah, we already occupy all of the parameter space. So beta one has to be equal to zero. Uh, and if we have beta two is equal to a half, then we have exactly one half left. So that means that beta one can be no bigger than a half. So if you uh, do that for a lot of different values, you'll see that it forms a diamond shaped parameter space. And yeah, it adds uh, 
also in uh, higher dimensions, but that's a bit difficult to draw. So let's just continue uh, with these two dimensions. So let's compare that to the rich penalty. In the rich penalty, we don't uh, penalize for the absolute values, but we penalize for the squared values. Now, if you do the same that I just did, and you square the maximum value of beta 1, and you square the maximum value of beta 2, and the sum cannot be bigger than 1, then you'll see that, uh, yeah, this forms a circular space. And in a higher, a higher dimensional space, it, it forms a sphere. Um, now, why does that matter? Uh, oh yeah, finally, the uh, elastic edge looks in between a uh, diamond and a circle, or in higher dimensional space, in between a diamond and a sphere. Uh, so it looks like this. But why does it matter? Why does it have anything to do with its ability to select variables? Let's say that we have an ordinarily squares uh, estimate where beta 1 is minus a half. So uh, beta 1 is over here. And beta 2 would be 1.5, right? And let's consider these three penalties where the sum of coefficients, uh, either absolute value or squared or combination, cannot be bigger than 1 then uh, this estimate is illegal, right? It's outside the parameter space. And so is this one, so is this one. So let's see what happens when we move away from the ordinary least squares uh, objective towards the restricted parameter space, right? And we're going to do that in a way that uh, we're going to enter it at a, a, a space where the sum of squares is uh, still minimal, provided we are in the parameter space. Now, this is why Lasso can select variables. It's very simple. If we draw these ellipses of equal sum of squares, then uh, it's possible that the ellipse touches the uh, 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 diamond at a corner. And when this happens, well, a corner means that one of the two variables is zero, right? In this example, beta one is zero. Um, and uh, yeah, for the rich regression, it's a circle. So the chance of hitting it exactly at zero is zero. <laughs> there is a probability of zero, which means that it almost never happens. Uh, that a, an estimate becomes exactly zero. And because of that, lasso can turn some things to zero, where rich regression will make things small, like this one. It's minus zero point something. It's small, but it's never exactly zero. Now, how does that relate to the elastic net? Uh, very simple. If you choose the elastic net such that it has uh, enough lasso regression, then, you know, the space will still be pointy enough for it to select variables. And if you make it more round, so if you uh, add more rich regression, then the chance is bigger that estimates enter somewhere um, which, which is not a corner. All right, so lastly, uh, yeah, regularization. I've been saying several times that it's a technique, and uh, we've only been talking about regression analysis, but regularization isn't only used in regression analysis. It's used in uh, many different things in statistics, including uh, neural networks, which, uh, yeah, sorry, it's, it's still a kind of regression, just a very complex one, but also in something completely different called conditional independence networks. And if you've ever seen a graph like this of uh, uh, variable interactions, uh, that's called a conditional independence network. Now, and uh, when you try to estimate something like this, you have the same problem as um, uh, with um, a regression, that if you have more variables between which you can estimate interactions than that you have samples, then you cannot estimate this graph unless you add a penalty. Uh, and yeah, this penalty uh, can be the same, can be rich, and can be lasso. Uh, I haven't seen an implementation of the elastic net yet for conditional independence networks, but that's technically also possible. So regularization is used a lot in statistics uh, with the general purpose of fighting overfitting and uh, with the general purpose of uh, performing an estimate, uh, performing an estimation when n is smaller than p. And uh, yeah, it's a difficult subject. So uh, if you're a bit confused by now, please go back to the point where I say what you have to know for the purpose of this course. Uh, but I hope that you uh, yeah, understand why regularization is used and uh, yeah, why it's a very useful technique uh, that some of you uh, might even end up using. Um, in fact, I encourage all of you to use it. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, that you've learned something here. Um, all right, in the assignment that I've uploaded on Brightspace, uh, there's a complete example. Uh, most of the assignment, you don't have to write any code. I just want you to comment on what's happening because I think uh, the purpose of uh, this lecture is not so much to become good at uh, regularized uh, regression, uh, 
uh, but more so to understand what regularization is and uh, why you would use it and what the difference is between these techniques. So uh, yeah, just go through the uh, codes that I've written in the assignment and uh, yeah, comment on the uh, questions that I've uh, added there. That's all for this uh, lecture. Uh, good luck with the assignment.